1933, Adolf Hitler is going to be appointed the Chancellor of Germany. And in, a year later, in 1934, he and his Nazi party will make move to dismantle the government of, of Weimar, Germany, and proclaim Adolf Hitler der Führer of Germany. Now, there's a lot more to this story, which we do not need to get into for this class, but I encourage you guys to read about it if you're interested. For our purposes, what we care about is where Adolf Hitler is coming from with regards to his foreign policy goals. Those goals are twofold. Number one, to create a greater Germany, a Germany for German-speaking people. So all of those Germans that live in Austria, the Germans that live in Poland, the Germans that live in Czechoslovakia, the Germans that live in France, all of those Germans should be a part of one Germany. And then two, the acquisition of Lebensraum. The acquisition of Lebensraum, or living space, for those German-speaking people. Because Hitler remembers World War I, and he remembers that the war was lost, not on the military side, because from Hitler's perspective, the German army surrendered when they were still in France. From Hitler's perspective, the war was lost because the people at home were suffering. The British blockade caused starvation and suffering of the citizens at home. So the acquisition of Lebensraum would give those 85 million German people the food that they need to survive within their own borders. All right? We want to be very careful with this word because if you accidentally throw another I in here and make it Liebensraum, it turns into love room, which would be a whole different idea altogether. But I think it would be hilarious if, if Adolf Hitler's uh, um, cronies thought he meant Liebensraum and they put it all together for him and they wanted to show him what they made and he walked into a, the open, yeah, I can imagine double doors opening up and him walking in and seeing just, you know, velvety pillows and mood lighting and everything and he's like, loses his mind because they totally misunderstood that he in fact wanted Lebensraum, not Lebensraum. So Adolf Hitler sets off these goals uh, in his books, Mein Kampf, which as we mentioned he wrote in prison in 1923, in his second book, but they're also more formally laid out in this Hosbach memorandum that you guys all read uh, last night. 1937, a meeting between Adolf Hitler and some of his top officials where he lays out some of the specifics of this acquisition of Lebensraum and the organization of a greater Germany, right? Now, where is Lebensraum going to come from? Eastern Europe or Western Europe? Eastern. Eastern Europe. Why do you guys think that Adolf Hitler is looking to the east for Lebensraum rather than to the west? Yes, Elise. Because by the Treaty of Versailles, the western borders were set, uh, like the Allied powers are federal, they're not called at that point, but the very good. And, and so we want to do the Treaty of Versailles, where those borders were originally set, but then the later in 1925, those Locarno treaties, which had Germany officially agreeing to Western borders, but leaving Eastern borders up for negotiation. Plus, the East, Poland and, and Russia further to the East. Yes, Kevin? Okay, so the East is filled with Slavic peoples, Jewish people, communists, all categories of people that Adolf Hitler does not have any time for. And he feels that that land should be rightfully German land. So Adolf Hitler lays out his foreign policy goals, creating a greater Germany, creating Lebensraum for the German state. He does this in his books. He does this in the Hussbach Memorandum. And now we will begin to move to, to create uh, this, this new Germany. He also wants to reestablish Germany's position uh, for foreign affairs. You know, before 1914, Germany was seen as one of these great powers. But the Treaty of Versailles had crippled Germany. The Treaty of Versailles was also humiliating for Germany. Remember, they lost their military, right? They had to give up territory. They had to admit blame for the war. Adolf Hitler wanted to erase uh, this, this humiliation that Germany would feel. So his first move is going to come with rearmament. And I want to look at this map of Germany really quickly. Because uh, it kind of lays down a lot of the, the little sections or regions of Germany that are going to be important to our story today. Uh, first of all, you see here... This region is known as the Ruhr. We mentioned last week that Ruhr crisis that Germany had to deal with, which was one of the things that led to the Locarno treaties and a little bit of an easing in relations between Germany and their Western partners. This area here, known as the Rhineland, the area that borders the Rhine River, it's a heavily industrialized area of Germany. 
This little nub right here is called the Saar, or the Saarland in Germany. Again, it's another industrially important area of, of Germany. And then in the east, these red splotches in Czechoslovakia, those are known as the Sudetenland. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. First, uh, we want to talk about Adolf Hitler's first step towards, re, uh, or towards abandoning the Treaty of Versailles is creating a new military. Adolf Hitler was told in the Treaty of Versailles that he couldn't have a military of more than anybody. Do we know how many? Uh, Eddie. 100,000. Yes, Eddie, very well done. 100,000 men. What about an Air Force, Eddie? No Air Force. What about a Navy, Eddie? Yeah, very little Navy with no submarines. No submarines. So virtually no military for this new German state after World War I. Well, Adolf Hitler can't create Greater Germany, nor can he acquire Lebensraum with no military. So his first step is going to be to rebuild this military, all right? But he wants to look like the good guy. He wants to maintain what he has at this point uh, of a moral high ground. In 1933, when he's Chancellor of Germany, this is before he's taken apart the German government. In 1933, there's going to be an international meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. It's called the Geneva Disarmament Conference. You might have heard of this last year. Hitler is going to go as the new Chancellor of Germany to, the, to Geneva to talk about disarmament. And Hitler, coming from the perspective of being disarmed for the last 15 years, tells the other member states there, hey, have I got a deal for all of us if we all really want world peace? And we don't want another war, because nobody wants another war, right? How about you, France, and Italy, and Britain? How about you all come down to our levels? How about you limit your militaries to 100,000 men? How about you limit your navies? How about you eliminate your military air forces? And then we will all be on equal footing, and then we will not be threats to each other anymore come down to my love. I want peace! This is me being Hitler for a moment. I want peace! So you come down to our levels to guarantee that peace. Now, of course, what's France going to think about this proposal? No. They will not agree to it. Britain won't agree to limiting their navy. It's not going to go anywhere. But at least in Hitler's mind, he's making the claim that he wants peace and he's trying to get the others to come down to his level and when they refuse to come down to his level especially France when France refuses to come down to German levels of military Hitler feels he only has one recourse for German security and what is that <laughs> to start bill well if you won't come down to us then we might have to rise up to you to keep ourselves secure so in 1933 yes ma'am does he genuinely want peace? According to his foreign policy goals, does Hitler genuinely want peace? What do you think? No. And he, when he makes his proposal, do you think he knows how that's going to be received? Absolutely. He knows France would never agree to such things. But by making the proposal, he can at least present himself as being somebody who wants to, to limit weapons. It would be akin to... Um, you know, Kim Jong-un right now saying, or, or maybe the leaders in, our, in Iran saying, okay, you don't want us to have nuclear weapons, so here's what we'll do. Because we don't have them yet. Kim Jong-un can't say this anymore, but Iran can say it. We don't have them. But how about the rest of the world eliminates their nuclear weapons? When Israel, who has never actually admitted having nuclear weapons, but we know, when Israel gets rid of their nuclear weapons, or when the United States dismantles their nuclear arsenal, then we will be comfortable not having one ourselves, right? Well, of course, the United States, we're not going to be getting rid of our nuclear arsenal anytime ever, right? Nor is Israel. So that's what Hitler knows what the answer is going to be to his demands, but he has to make that so he can present himself as a guy that is just all about peace. So in 1933, Adolf Hitler and, Nazi, or in Germany, pardon me, not quite Nazi Germany yet, 
Adolf Hitler and the German state will start to rebuild their military in violation of the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles. By the end of 1933, the German army is up to 300,000 men. This is three times what the, what the uh, Treaty of Versailles called for. Yes, ma'am. 33. So by 1933, the German army is up to 300,000 men. Now, there's some talk about Hitler, like, secretly rebuilding his military. But I think a lot of that secret rebuilding of the military is overblown because it's hard to secretly rebuild your military, like, by three times or later five times what it was purported to be. So other nations are, are they know, France knows, Britain knows, that Germany is violating the Treaty of Versailles in terms of the size of this military. But what's the recourse here? What do you do? Are they going to go to war over it? Absolutely not. Why? Because war is the worst thing that could ever happen, and everybody now recognizes that. And Adolf Hitler, when he is rebuffed by the other member states of the League of Nations in Geneva, he will do the same thing that Japan did to the League of Nations when Japan, told, uh, or when Japan was told to get out of Manchuria. He'll just leave the League of Nations. And what, what's the League of Nations going to do about it? They're not going to do anything. His next step, his next step in rearmament, uh, oh, he also starts rebuilding a navy. He also starts rebuilding an air force. By 1935, by 1935, the German army is going to number over 500,000 men when Adolf Hitler reinstates a draft in Germany. Uh, we're we're going to want to use the word conscription. He will reinstate conscription in Germany. 35. Basically forcing German men, young German men, to join the military. And that's a surefire way to grow the size of your army. Also in 1935, there will be a meeting between Adolf Hitler, or between Germany and Britain where they will sign what's known as the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. Anglo-German Naval Treaty between England and Germany about navies. Where the British are going to allow Nazi Germany to build a navy that is one-third the size of the British Navy, but with an equal number of submarines. Because what possible harm could Germany having a new U-boat fleet cause? U-boat, uh, Unterseeboot, uh, a, a German, German submarine. So, yes, sir? If, if the Germans have U-boats, then they can send them out to the Atlantic and cut off German, I mean, Britain's supplies to the Dutch colonies. Absolutely. I was kind of being rhetorical in my, my, my question there. But yes, we can see the threat that German U-boats can cause then why would Britain ever sign on to such agreement allowing Germany to have them? What's that? Maybe they're underestimating? Uh, can you hold that question for just a second? Eddie. Appeasement. Uh, oh, Eddie bringing the big word of the day in. Appeasement. Very good. Appeasement becomes the official government policy of Britain. Now, today, we snicker. We're like, oh, that's ridiculous. How could they not see what was coming down the road? But remember how much easier it is for us to see what's coming because all I have to do is advance a couple slides. British leadership in 1935 didn't have me. Poor guys. They didn't know what was to come. They had legitimate hopes at the time that maybe giving into some of these German demands allowing Germany to build a navy might, rather than causing a future war with Germany, might avoid that future war. Might make Germany not only not fight a war with you, but might make them viable trade partners going forward. That was the hope in 1935. Yeah? You called this the Anglo-German Anglo Naval Treaty, or Anglo-German Naval Agreement. You had a question, and then Rania. I think this, that, yes, okay, so Britain has still got the biggest navy in the world. I think part of the reason, Britain is very comfortable signing a naval agreement with Germany that still limits them to only one-third of the size of the British navy because Britain's navy is so 
much larger at this point. Uh, but really, Britain is just hoping to have Hitler on their good side, to have a viable trade partner going forward. Rania? Um, how were they able to make that decision on their own? How, why is this just a bi We would call this a bilateral agreement. It's an agreement just between two parties rather than a multilateral agreement where like France would be wrapped in or anything. Because any two countries can make any agreements that they ever want to. Now, what do you think France thinks of this? But what's France going to do? Is France going to go to war with Germany? Or, or in this case, go to war with Germany without Britain's help? No, 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 no. They're not. And remember, they're all still living under that 1925 Locarno Treaty that says those parties won't go to war with each other. And if any, but those are, those are what we call defensive agreements. So what it means is if Germany decides to invade France then Britain is compelled to help France, all right? But if Germany goes and attacks anywhere else, no one's compelled to do anything about that. And there's nothing in that agreement that says, that says Germany can't rebuild its military or, or, or Britain has to step up if Germany violates the Treaty of Versailles. So the Anglo-German Naval Treaty in 1935 is essentially Britain letting Adolf Hitler throw away the Treaty of Versailles, all right? Why? Well, because the Treaty of Versailles was now written in a previous generation, and, and there are hopes that, that Britain has that through a policy of appeasement, by giving in to some demands, we can avoid greater conflict. And we want to avoid greater conflict because conflict now in the 20th century is the worst thing ever. And if it was that bad in 1914 to 1918, it is going to be even worse when the next war comes, or if the next war comes. So let's do everything in our power to avoid the next war coming. And we want to be careful on judging these, these players because we know that that war is coming, but they don't. All right? And the other side of the coin, do any of us know firsthand what World War I was like? No, we can read about it. Right? But we didn't live through it. All right. And a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. We were tiny. We had a very tiny army in the 1930s. Um, and why could we have a tiny army? The question, the question was, um, well, how big was the United States Army at the time? Um, why could we have a, a tiny army? We don't feel that threatened by Mexico or Canada. And the oceans are a tremendous buffer to, to any other threats that might might come to the United States. So we actually have a very small military. Uh, we'll talk in a few minutes about how Czechoslovakia in the 1930s had a larger army than the United States did. Yes, ma'am. Um, we know that Hitler wanted to take North, right? So like, did the German people want to as well? They're, they're drinking the Hitler Kool-Aid pretty, pretty heavy by 1935-36. Yes. And in fact, in 1936, um, Famously, uh, Germany, Berlin, the city of Berlin is going to host the uh, Summer Olympic Games. And so it's going to be a, a showcase for, for this new Germany that's born. And, and the German people are eating it up, and the, the international community is, is loving it as well. So there's not a lot of people outside of France that are too bent out of shape about, about this move by Hitler. So the army is going to start growing. The navy is going to be growing a new Luftwaffe, or Air Force. Uh, Luftwaffe. Air force, air gun, literally. Um, so Luftwaffe is going to be born, and no one stops it. There's no one there to stop it. Now we want to look at this little tiny region here called the Saar. Back at the Treaty of Versailles, which is technically still in play even though it's being dismantled, back in the Treaty of Versailles, it says that the Saar region will have its coal production going over to France for the next 15 years. Now, this treaty was ratified in 1919. So this, for the next 15 years, the coal production in the Saar will go to France as a form of reparations for the war. And then after 15 years, that will cease. But then the people of the Saar will get to hold what's called a plebiscite. Oh, another word. A plebiscite. This comes from uh, the, the old Roman Empire with the plebeians or the plebs. Um, these are the common people in Rome. A plebiscite in Rome is, or pardon me, a plebiscite in Europe, typically this word is used in European politics, a plebiscite is where we let the people vote on something. 
We call them referendums typically in our country where we let the people decide. So, um, you know, if, if, if the people of the state of Michigan get to vote on whether gay marriage should be legal or something like that, that's a referendum. It's not something be de being decided by a legislative body. So the Treaty of Versailles called for a plebiscite in the Tsar 15 years later. Well, fast forward, doo -doo 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 -doo. 15 years later is 1934. Now Adolf Hitler is in power. And the people of the Tsar region get to pick. Do you want to be a part of France or do you want to be a part of Germany? And they will overwhelmingly, 90% of that population will choose to go the way of Germany. For Adolf Hitler, this is a vote of confidence. For Adolf Hitler, this is the German people speaking in approval that they like what you're doing. And so it will encourage him to push more. His next push is going to be into the Rhineland. Now the Rhineland, as we already mentioned, is German territory. The Rhineland is German territory that they were not allowed to have military in, according to the Treaty of Versailles. Adolf Hitler is going to move to remilitarize the Rhineland in March of 1934. Pardon me, March of 1936. Sorry about that. In March of 1936, the Rhineland will be remilitarized. Hitler's generals are nervous about this. They do not think they are ready if France or if Britain objects to this violation of the Treaty of Versailles. They do not think they are ready to stop a French invasion in March of 1936. Because what's the situation of the German military in March of 1936? Yes, sir. They're still rebuilding. They're stronger than they were under right. the treaty, but they aren't at full strength. So it's growing, but it does, it's not where his generals feel he needs to be. But Hitler's going to press ahead anyway, because what is he not really afraid of? He's not really afraid of France or Britain going to war. Why? Because no one wants war. Wars are hell. Wars are scary. We know what war is now. And what would it be going to war over? A little piece of land. It would, well, a little piece of land that is whose land? It's German land. And this is going to have to be something that's always in the back of your mind in this class. What do the governments of France and England and even the United States later in the war have to consider that Adolf Hitler never has to? Mr. What's that? Support of the people. Why do they have to care about support of the people? These are democratic states. They have, they have democratically elected leaders. Yes, ma'am. Oh, no, absolutely. It's, it's a pretty heavily populated area. It's a very industrially rich area. Uh, yes, absolutely. I was picturing like an Nope, nope. It was, this was, this is like the industrial heart of, of Germany along the Rhine River there. Uh, yes? Um, there was oversight, um, you know, kind of League of Nations oversight, but, but no, no military force was stationed in the Rhineland. Um, so, in March of 1936, Adolf Hitler, in defiance of his general's wishes, is going to send troops into the Rhineland, to remilitarize the Rhineland. And as we know, Britain and France will do nothing about it. Because they wouldn't have popular support. Can you imagine the British leadership or the French leadership saying, we're going to go to war with Germany! And the population saying, yeah, wait a minute, what are we going to war about? It's always important, especially in democratic states, but also in dictatorships, for leaders to give what's called a causus belli. Belli, uh, this comes from a, uh, a Roman root uh, that means uh, war, right? Like um, being, to be bellicose or to be belligerent is to be like warlike, right? Um, lady antebellum is a name that means lady years before. Bologna is the Roman god. Bologna? B-E-L-L-O-N-A. -E -L -L That's how you spell the Roman goddess of war today. Okay. I remember that song now. Bologna. Excellent. So um, Lady Antebellum is Lady Years Before the Civil War, which is a weird name for a band. But uh, causes belly is the reason for war. Leaders often have to give some reason for war, whether people are going to accept it or not. Well, what would be the reason for war here? It would be, be because... Germany is sending troops. Well, where are they sending troops? They're sending troops into another part of Germany. Oh, well, they're not sending them into another country? 
No, but they're putting him into a part of Germany that they were told not to go. Yeah, but they haven't really invaded anybody, right? No, but they could. Yeah, war is pretty bad, and I don't think I want to go to war or send my kid to war to stop Germany from putting German troops into a different part of Germany. And France wouldn't go to war unless Britain would do it, and Britain wouldn't do anything on their own unless France would do it, and Britain just signed a big agreement with Germany allowing them to have a navy, so we know they're not doing anything. So Adolf Hitler is right. There is no negative reaction from France or Britain in terms of his remilitarization. Now what France and Britain do start to do after this remilitarization of the Rhineland is they start getting on the horse, rebuilding their own militaries and growing their own armies. All right? So start to, to speed up their military reconstruction. Everybody good? All right, the next step. We go look down in Austria. And this is called the Anschluss. Ah, let's just make it a Scharfes S. And A-N-S-C-H-L-U. And then that's a Scharfes S. That's like two S's in Germany. Um, for those of you that love the sound of music, the Anschluss is like the backdrop of the movie or the, the musical, uh, the sound of music, all right? You guys might be familiar with that. Um, there's a lot of political intrigue in this story. Let's just leave it for our class at this. Adolf Hitler wants Austria. Why? It's German. It's a greater Germany. He's from there, right? Through the 1930s, all the way up until 1938, Adolf Hitler is going to be supporting a growing Nazi party in Austria. In March of 1938, in March of 1938, Adolf Hitler will have his military roll into Austria, and you guys can see that happening right here. He will have his military roll into Austria under the guise of protecting the Nazi government within Austria because there were some riots and protests and things like this. So Adolf Hitler sends his army in to Austria to, according to him, calm things down. But we all know, of course, that he was just absorbing this Austrian state in what is known as the Anschluss, a political union with Austria. Now, this is another thing that was forbidden in the Treaty of Versailles. Germany was not allowed to have a political union with Austria in the Treaty of Versailles. And Austria, in their own treaty to end World War I, it was called the Treaty of St. Germain, they were told that they can't join with Germany. But now the German army moves in and occupies Austria. Another plebiscite, another vote of the Austrian people is scheduled for a month later. And overwhelmingly, 98% of the Austrian population will vote for Anschluss. They will vote to join Germany. Well, once again, we go back to Britain and France. Why do nothing Britain and France? War is terrible. And what would we be going to war for? To defend Austria. You want me to go to war to defend Austria? Yeah! Well, what are the Austrians doing about it? Well, they're not actually doing anything themselves. They are voting and saying they totally want to be a part of Germany. Wait a minute. You want me to go fight and possibly die for Austrians who aren't fighting for themselves? That's not going to go anywhere, right? So there is no political support for Germany to be attacked by France or Britain after this Anschluss. But we can see very clearly now Nazi Germany's plan of creating a greater Germany is coming to fruition. Questions, comments, concerns at this point? All right. This is all part and parcel to the appeasement policy that is being actually officially adopted by the British government towards Germany. We use this word appeasement today. I'm a parent and you guys are children, so you probably all understand it very well. When my kids want something from me, Dad, can I have a piece of candy? I say, no, dinner is like right around the corner. And they say, well, Dad, really, just one. No, dinner, it's going to spoil your dinner, rot your teeth. It's going nev to never, never amount to anything. Uh, no, okay, that was a little harsh. Dad, please let me have a piece of candy. Oh, fine, I'm ready to go all Neville Chamberlain on you. Neville Chamberlain, British Prime Minister, we'll talk about him in a second. 
if I give you this candy, will you just stop asking me for candy? Yeah, that's all I wanted. <laughs> all right, fine, have the candy. And then, of course, we know as parents, well, you guys don't know, but you know as kids, your whining, your pushing just got exactly what you wanted. So, of course, the next time down the road, you can ask for another piece of candy, right? The, your, your begging for things won't end. Now, I appease my children because sometimes I just need them to move along and go away and leave me alone for a few minutes, all right? Britain is going to be appeasing Germany because, not because they don't, they don't want war, we know that. And they're starting to think maybe war is going to come someday in the future. But by appeasing, by maybe giving in to some demands, what is it allowing Britain and, and France to do? Push off the war, which does what? It gives them more time to rearm. But what's the other side of that coin? Germany is rearming as well. All right? Germany is rearming as well. But this actually is the policy of the British government as laid out by this prime minister. Pardon me. Uh, as laid out by, where are we at? This prime minister. Uh, this is Neville Chamberlain. He's the prime minister of England uh, in 1938. The next step for Hitler is to go and look at Czechoslovakia. The western portion of Czechoslovakia is a region known as the Sudetenland. These are German-speaking lands. These are German-speaking lands that were given over to a new Czechoslovakian nation after World War I. Adolf Hitler wants to create a greater Germany. He needs the Sudetenland. Now, Czechoslovakia is a little bit of an interesting case, though. When Czechoslovakia was created, when Czechoslovakia was created, it was purposely created by France and Britain to give another country on the eastern portion of Germany that could possibly be a, a threat to Germany or an ally to France going forward. Remember, we wanted in World War I, Germany, we wanted them to have a two-front war that they would have to fight. That's why France allied with, the, so with, with Russia at the beginning of World War I. Well, Czechoslovakia might provide much of the same to uh, a French state. And in fact, as we get into the 1930s, France is going to become one of the biggest uh, providers of foreign aid to Czechoslovakia. France, in the 1930s, is working on building a line of defenses on their German border. They're working on building a line of defenses on their German border called the Maginot Line. We'll talk more, more about this later. They're building a line of defenses. France remembers that the last war was a trench warfare. So their idea for fighting a possible next war is to build the sweetest trenches that mankind has ever built. Concrete fortified bunkers that stretch for hundreds of miles and you can house hundreds of thousands of men in them. Uh, the biggest guns that are, are in production 19, in the late 1930s. France is building this all on the Maginot Line. All right? Now, of course, no one could possibly believe that Germany might one day invade France through Belgium where the Maginot Line didn't... St well, okay, that's the exact same thing that happened in the Schlieffen Plan. There's a couple problems with this. Like, why didn't France build the Maginot Line all the way to the English Channel. Few issues. Remember, military resources are finite, right? There's only so much. Just like those big, thick rubber bands that bind up your broccoli at the grocery store. If you were to stretch that thing out, what happens to the rubber band? It gets thinner and thinner, and it might eventually snap. It gets weaker in its, in its midpoints, right? So if you were to stretch the limited military resources that built the fortifications of the Maginot Line, if you were to stretch those a couple hundred more miles to the English Channel, those, forces, those fortifications would be even weaker. And then, what would Belgium think? Belgium, who you've got defensive agreements with, what do you think they would think as they started to see the construction of a line of fortifications point behind them with guns pointed at Belgium? Belgium probably wouldn't be too keen on that. So, this is what France is up to. More about that to come later. But when France is supporting Czechoslovakia, Guess what Czechoslovakia is going to start building along their western border? Yes, sir? Their own border fortifications model. Very good. Their own border, for, border fortifications that are going to look a lot like the Maginot Line. 
It's a Czechoslovakian version of the Maginot Line. And those fortifications are going to be on that border region, which is also like a highland region, higher in elevation, known as the Sudetenland. And Adolf Hitler wants the Sudetenland because they have German-speaking peoples in it and because it's strategically important land. He wants the Sudetenland. So Hitler, Hitler calls on some Nazi allies in the Sudeten regions of Czechoslovakia to start causing trouble. And cause trouble they do. And so Hitler will follow suit by, by making demands that those German-speaking people in the Sudetenland are not safe in a Czechoslovakian state. He wants them to be a part of Germany because there's chaos over there and they're not being treated well. So Neville Chamberlain is going to come to the rescue. Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Neville Chamberlain is going to come to the rescue. Sorry, I've got to control two things here. And he makes an agreement with Adolf Hitler. He says, Hitler... Let's work it out to where those areas of the Sudetenland that are 50% German, they will go to you. Those areas of the Sudetenland that are not 50% German, they will stay in Czechoslovakia. And Hitler says, that's all I've been asking for. No problem. Excellent. One week later, Hitler reneges on his demands, on his agreement, and he says, no. I want all of Czechoslovakia, or pardon me, all of the Sudetenland. Chamberlain is furious. He is almost ready to go to war with Adolf Hitler over this. But luckily for him and the world at the time, Benito Mussolini is there to save the day. Benito Mussolini, in talking with Neville Chamberlain, says, hey, I can get Hitler to a meeting, and let's work this out. Because what do none of us want? None of us want war. War is the worst thing ever. So in September of 1938, we're going to have a meeting between Neville Chamberlain. We're going to have a meeting between Neville Chamberlain, the French president, a guy named Edward de Laudier. You don't need to remember his name, but if you do, hats off to you. Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. And then some other guy who's standing over here who's doing something odd that people are looking at, but I don't know who that is. And I'm making that up. I don't really know that anyone's over here. But certainly Deladier and Hitler, or pardon me, Deladier and uh, Mussolini aren't, aren't down with whatever's going on on the side there. So in September of 1938, we're going to have a meeting in Munich, Germany, organized by, by Benito Mussolini. Munich. It's, uh, it's a city in the southern portion of Germany. 1938, September of 1938. Notice who is not at this meeting. France is there. That's Edward de Laudier. He's the French president. The United States is not there because we're minding our own. Czechoslovakia is not there. We're, they're, they're literally talking about carving up Czechoslovakia at this meeting. And Czechoslovakia is not invited. And it kind of makes sense why they're not invited, right? They're not going to be happy with what happens. So they probably wouldn't want to hear what's going on anyway and wouldn't have any say over it anyway. Any other big country not present? Soviet, Soviet Union's not there. Joseph Stalin is not here. He's not going to be too happy about his not being invited as well. Czechoslovakia also borders the Soviet Union on, on its other side. Yes? So did Great Britain control Czechoslovakia? Or nope. Control? Czechoslovakia is a sovereign nation. Remember, what did the Locarno Treaty say about the borders of Eastern Europe? Those, those can be negotiable. Those can be up for negotiation. But, yeah, Czechoslovakia absolutely is going to feel like it is being left out to hang here. Yes? It is called the Munich Conference. And out of the Munich Conference will come the Munich Pact. The Munich Agreement. The Munich Pact. And the Munich Pact says that all of the Sudetenland, all of the Sudetenland will go to Germany. All of the Sudetenland will go to Germany. So all of this stuff now becomes German. Even the parts that were not 50% German, all of the Sudetenland goes to Germany. But what does that mean for like that 
Czechoslovakian Maginot line they had built. Yes? Very good. Now, the, the greatest line of fortifications that the Czechoslovakian state had is now in German hands. And, as we already mentioned, those fortifications were modeled on the French fortifications. So guess what Germany gets to practice with before a big war with France? A scale model of the French defenses. Wow. And what's left for the rest of Czechoslovakia? Uh-oh. Well, not yet, because there's one other part to the Munich Pact. So all of the Sudetenland goes to Czechoslovakia, but you can imagine that Czechoslovakia would feel pretty bad about this. So the Munich Pact also says that Britain and France and Germany and Italy all pledge to defend sovereign Czechoslovakia. No more messing with Czechoslovakia. Italy, France, Italy, France Germany, and Britain, all those countries at the Munich Conference. They will all pledge to defend Czechoslovakia. and that their borders would be guaranteed. One final note about the Munich Conference. Neville Chamberlain and Adolf Hitler will sign their own agreement called the Anglo-German Declaration. Anglos, England, German, Germany, Declaration. The Anglo-German Declaration that says Germany and Britain will not go to war with each other. Kind of like a mini kellogg Brienne pact just for those two countries. It's like a treaty of friendship between Germany and England. The Anglo-German Declaration. This is a photo of Neville Chamberlain getting off of his plane from the Munich Conference at the airport being met by throngs of media and citizens of England. And he waves in, his, in the air the Anglo-German Declaration that says no war with Germany. And he says, now infamously, we will have peace in our time. And how does the crowd react? How could you imagine? They all go wild. There might be one guy going, Rrr, and that's Winston Churchill. We're going to talk about him in a little bit. But the crowd goes wild. And this is important to remember that the crowd goes wild because as today, history looks back at Neville Chamberlain and assigns to him a lot of the blame for Hitler becoming what Hitler became. He was the democratically elected leader of the British Parliament. He was doing what the people of England supported at the time. All right? History does not remember Neville Chamberlain too fondly. And in fact, and I'll show you in a few minutes when we're, when we're done with the lecture, I can Google Obama and Chamberlain and find dozens of articles where people that aren't too fond of, of Barack Obama are accusing him of being an appeaser like Neville Chamberlain. But then I could also Google Bush and Chamberlain and find some older articles where people would accuse George Bush of being an appeaser. And I could probably do the same with Clinton, and I could probably do the same with Bush, 41, and I could probably do the same with Reagan, and every other, maybe not as much with Reagan, but I can do the same with, with almost every politician since 1938 when this went down. All right? In March of 1939, in March of 1939, Adolf Hitler's German army will invade Czechoslovakia, the rest of Czechoslovakia. We remember they pledged themselves to defend Czechoslovakia. That is out the window. They invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia in March of 1939. This is important because this is Hitler's first taking of Lebensraum. The first time he's taking land that's not just German territory that would be supported by the German people in it. This is his first taking of actual foreign territory. Or, or actual Lebensraum with non-German speaking people. Chamberlain is furious. Britain and France officially end their policy of appeasement. Notice they don't go to war. They don't do that. That's going far because no one wants war. They don't feel ready for war. But they do draw a new line in the sand for Hitler not to cross. And that line becomes Poland. That line becomes Poland. Britain and France make a public proclamation or declaration to the Polish people to defend Polish sovereignty and issue an ultimatum to Adolf Hitler. 
You stay out of Poland or it is war. Now, Adolf Hitler, of course, wants Poland because Poland means what? Lebensraum. Poland means Lebensraum. But he's got to be nervous about Poland because on the other side of Poland is the Soviet Union. And Adolf Hitler knows that in World War I, fighting a two-front war was challenging for Germany. So in order to avoid that two-front war, Adolf Hitler, who is no friend of the Soviet Union, and he hates communism, Adolf Hitler will send an ambassador to the Soviet Union to meet with Soviet officials. This is in August of 1939. I want to say it's August 26th that the agreement is officially signed. Wanting to avoid a two-front war, Hitler makes an agreement with Joseph Stalin. The agreement is this. One, the Soviet Union and Germany won't attack each other. That is called the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. The Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. Kevin, for quiz bowl purposes? Look at him go. It's my boy. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. After Molotov, the Soviet official, and Ribbentrop, the German. Excellent. You guys, Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, we're good to go. Um, in August 1939, Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. It is going to be a public declaration that neither the Soviet Union nor Germany are going to attack each other. And why do you have to make that public proclamation? So Britain and France know that they're on their own and they're not going to have big Russia to help them out this time around. Then there's a secret agreement. A secret agreement that is not publicly declared. That Germany and the Soviet Union will each invade new, or sovereign Poland. Germany from the west, Soviet Union from the east, and they will divide it in half. This is called the Partition of Poland. So Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact is like, we won't attack you, you don't attack us. But then as the secret agreement, the Partition of Poland. The Soviet Union gets the eastern portion of Poland, which they're happy with because much of this territory was originally Russian back before World War I. And the Germans will take the western portion, which they're happy with because a lot of this territory was part of Prussia before World War I. Yes, ma'am. The Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact with a part of it called the Partition of Poland. Oh, is that just like a, a part of it? it it's, it's, not a, it's not a publicly pronounced part of it. Wow, we're getting into Peter Piper, Pickle Piper, Pickle Piper's territory here. <laughs> this wasn't a, uh, a publicly pronounced portion of the, of the treaty, but the Partition of Poland was an agreement by these two nations. So we know now what's going to happen next. One week late, yes, sir? Did the Baltics get assigned to the Soviets in the same agreement? Mm, I don't believe they, I don't believe there was any discussion there, but I think the Soviets had free reign to do what they want because that was out of, at this point, out of the parameters of what the, the Germans were at. But I don't know that they were worked into that agreement. So, of course, now we come to um, September 1st, 1939. September 1st, 1939. And the German army will invade Poland. Just as they had our long plan to do. Yes? What date was that? September 1st. Of all the dates, like specific days that I mentioned or months that I mentioned, this is like one probably to have in your memory bank. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. And you can imagine what's going to happen, right? Britain and France are going to declare war on Germany, right? No, not right away. No one wants war. So they say to Germany, get out of Poland. We're going to give you an ultimatum. We're going to give you a deadline to get out of Poland. Meanwhile, Poland is getting battered by the German blitzkrieg. We'll talk about that next class or in a couple classes. Two days are going to pass before September 3rd, 1939, when Germany hasn't left Poland. They won't leave Poland until the Soviet army drives them out of Poland in 1945. Two days pass with Germany not listening to these ultimatums from the British and the French, when on September 3rd, 1939, Britain and France will declare war on Germany. 
and now we have a second world war in Europe.